Okay, so now we can finally go on to the five famous physics formulas. As the page is called. <clears throat> for, uh, and it says for each formula given, uh, solve for the other two variables and set up a little triangle. And uh, it also mentions that you don't have to use the triangle method, of course. Any method that actually gets you to the right answer is okay. So number one is F equals MA. And this comes from force is equal to mass times acceleration. But you don't have to know that part yet. We will get to that when we do the physics though. And if that's the equation, then what would A be equal to and what would M be equal to? Well, arranging a, you know, rearranging a simple equation like this, not all that difficult, but there might be harder ones with three terms that we wanna do in the future. So it's good to get in practice with the easy ones. F is equal to M times A. Now M times A means that M and A have to be next to each other, which means they have to go on the bottom and that leaves F to be in the other space. So F equals MA. <clears throat> if you wanna know what A is equal to, now that the uh, triangle is set up, you would cover up A and see what's left. A is F over M. M would be F over A. And so once you're using the triangle method, it's really just that simple. <clears throat> the main catch is that you have to look at the relationship on the side of the equation that has two things on it when you're setting up the triangle. A lot of people will uh, just take what the equation is solved for and put that on top blindly. Sometimes that's what you are supposed to do like here, but sometimes it's not. And so you really have to look at like M times A, like I said, means M and A have to be next to each other. There are other equations. Uh, well, the next one is kind of similar. W equals F times D. And that comes from work is equal to force times distance. <clears throat> and we might want to know from this, what is F and what is D? And so if we set up our triangle correctly, we should be able to tell pretty easily. Again, look at the side with two variables on it, and that would be F times D, which means F and D have to go next to each other, and that would be that would leave W to be the other space. And so now if you want to know what F is, just cover up F and see what's left, W over D. Work divided by distance would be force and D, Cover up D and see what's left, W over F. So work divided by force would be distance. Okay, three is P equals W over T. This is power is work divided by time. or sometimes energy divided by time. But in physics, energy and work are generally considered to be basically the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so what if we wanna know what is work or what is time? Well, let's set up an equator, a, a triangle and see. Power is work over time. Again, look at the side of the equation with two variables on it. Work over time means that work goes in the top space here, and time goes in one of the bottom spaces. So, and then power is in the other space. So power is equal to work over time. If we want to know what work is, you cover that up, and you have power times time. And if you wanna know what time is, you cover that up, and you have work divided by power. All right. Okay, four. <clears throat> uh, 
um, the uh, thing that looks kind of like a fancy P with no corners on it is actually the Greek letter rho, which is the symbol that physicists tend to use for density. So I'll just put D equals in parentheses here so you know that that's density. And density is mass over volume. If you want to use a triangle for this, you can do that. And you would set it up by looking at the side of the equation with the two variables on it. That's mass over volume. That means mass goes on top. Volume goes in one of the spaces on the bottom and the symbol for density would go in the other. Okay, so um, rho, that is density, is equal to mass over volume. Uh, let's see, so if we're looking for mass or volume, we can rearrange the equation. For mass, again, you cover up mass and you see what's left. Density times volume is what's left. Density times volume will give you mass. If you want V for volume, you cover that up and you see mass divided by density should be volume. And indeed, that's what it is. That does work out. Five is going to be um, P is F over T, and this stands for impulse equals force times time. Okay, so from this equation, you could solve for F or T. From the original equation, again, look at the side with two variables on it. We have force over time. So that means force has to go on top and time goes in one of the bottom spaces. Doesn't matter which one. And then P would go in the other bottom space. So we have P, if you want that, that's force over time, which is what we started with. F, you cover that up, you see power times, or sorry, um, Wait a minute. Oh yeah, impulse, right, sorry. Um, impulse times time. And time would be force divided by pulse. Okay, so pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Okay, we're going to do more of the three variable equations a little bit later. First, we're going to do a little bit on proportionality. Proportionality has to do with how one variable in an equation changes relative to another variable, as another var variable changes. So it's how one variable in an equation, uh, that means equation, changes uh, in relation to change in another variable. And you use them a lot in these three variable equations um, where say one of the variable, one of the variables is fixed and you're wondering how the other two react as one of them is changed.
And so uh, in a three variable equations, very often we'll hold one variable fixed and then we'll change one of the other variables and we'll see how the third variable reacts. Uh, does it change the same way or does it change the opposite way? Uh, does it change more or you know, does it change less? You know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, the symbol for proportionality is the Greek letter alpha. Uh, when written by hand, it looks kind of like a fish. <clears throat> when written by, when uh, written in uh, most fonts, uh, like on word processors, it comes out looking more like, um, you know, okay, maybe something kind of like that, which looks a little bit more like our A, which is what the alpha eventually developed into. Um, is if you take this that I just drew, which is kind of like what an alpha looks like when you um, print it, you know, like in a word processor, if you just sort of curl over the top a little bit, now you can see that looks like the way most word processor fonts render the letter A. And that's because it grew out of this. So anyway, alpha mathematically means proportional to. There are different ways of being proportional though. One is direct proportionality. <clears throat> and what that means is that basically the two variables in question will change in the same direction and by the same factor, if one of them is changed. And what that means is to say if you, if one variable is doubled, the other will double also. If you know the first variable is cut in half, then the second variable would be cut in half, and so on. And this uh, symbol here, A alpha B, uh, actually just means A is directly proportional to B. So that's what that means. <clears throat> okay, so if A is doubled, B doubles also. And vice versa, if B is doubled, that means A doubles. If one of them is cut in half, the other one is also cut in half. If one of them is uh, increased by a factor of 2.43, then the other goes up by a factor of 2.43. So they basically change by the same factor and in the same direction. And a good example for that would be say, um, area is equal to length times width. And so we can look at this equation. We can say, say that area is directly proportional to width. If the length is held constant. Okay. And the way you could say this is a alpha W area is proportional to width. And you can prove that mathematically just by looking at, uh, say, 
if length is equal to 10 feet and width is equal to 10 feet. then area would be 10 times 10 or 100 square feet. <clears throat> if the length is kept at 10 feet, but the width it goes up to 20 feet, then the area would be 10 times 20, which is 200 square feet. And so in other words, width doubled, while length was held constant, and what happens is that area doubles. And since they change by the same factor, they are directly proportional. Okay, so that's uh, directly proportional. We also have inverse proportionality. And inversely proportional just means that the two terms change by the same factor, but in opposite directions. And so what that means is that basically if one variable doubles, the other one is cut in half. If one variable triples, the other is cut to one third what it originally was. Or in other words, when one variable increases, the other one decreases by the same factor. And the symbol for that would be to say that one thing is proportional to one over the other thing. I never have word, room for that word. So A is inversely proportional to B is what that means. <clears throat> so for example, if A doubles, B is cut in half. And it also works the other way around. If B is doubled, A is cut in half. Okay. Okay, so there are uh, certain examples of that. Say, density. Uh, for density, Density is equal to mass over volume, and I'm going to use the, the chemist's symbol for density, uh, D. And um, D is mass over volume. So if mass is held constant, density is proportional to 1 over the volume. So in other words, if volume doubles, the density is cut in half.
It's another way of looking at that. Okay. Um, Uh, so say a sample has a mass of 10 grams and a volume of, um, say, I don't want to say 20, yeah, 20, um, 20 milliliters. The density would be 10 grams divided by 20 milliliters, and that would be 10 divided by 20 is 0.5 grams per milliliter. If the volume is doubled, uh, I'm going to do this on the next page because I'm running out of room. If another sample has a, the same volume, sorry, same mass, of 10 grams and a volume of 40 milliliters. So the volume is doubled from the first example while the mass has stayed the same. Density is going to be mass over volume or it's going to be 10 grams divided by 40 milliliters, which is 0.25 grams per milliliter. which means the density is half what it was before, before it was 0.5. So that's what being inversely proportional means. Okay, say for another example, uh, for directly proportional, just to go back to that for a moment, A good example of that would be uh, workers pay when you're paid by the hour. So if you're being paid by the hour, your total amount of pay would be your hourly rate, you know, like $15 an hour times the number of hours you actually work. We could say P is equal to H times T, uh, with P being your total pay, H being the hourly rate, and T being the amount of time or the number of hours that you actually worked. Assuming that the hourly rate remains the same, And then we can say that the amount of pay you earn is directly proportional to the amount of time you work. And that makes sense because, you know, that's generally is the way things work. <clears throat> okay, if, if you work uh, twice as many hours, is assuming that you're not getting overtime pay, uh, which most people don't these days. Um, but, you know, if you work twice as many hours next week as you did this week, then you'll make twice as much money. And it allows us to, um, you know, see the relationship between hours worked and the total pay without really having to know what the hourly rate is. Uh, because this equation actually is true. No matter how much you're making per hour, the amount you make is still proportional to the number of hours you work as long as the, the amount you make per hour doesn't actually change. But it could be $15 an hour or, you know, it could be $20 an hour or whatever. <clears throat> it's still true that the amount of pay is proportional to the amount of time worked. <clears throat> if you were to uh, do a graph of the amount of pay versus the amount of hours worked, you would end up with a straight line that uh, goes up at a, like a 45 degree angle. <clears throat> sort of like this. 
something like that. Uh, within my, the, you know, within my artistic ability to actually draw a straight line anyway, that's a straight line. <clears throat> Inversely proportional would be like, for instance, another example would be average speed. Um, in this equation, if you keep time constant, then speed is proportional to distance. You know, the more distance you cover in a given amount of time, the faster you're traveling. That's a direct proportion. An indirect proportion would be speed versus time. <clears throat> if distance is constant. So the, basically, the more time it takes you to make the trip, the slower you're going. <clears throat> and if, the, say, if the time doubles, then your speed is cut in half. If you think of just, um, say, driving to Rochester, <clears throat> and we'll say, just for the sake of argument, the dis distance between here and Rochester is uh, 60 miles. If I make that trip in one hour, my speed is 60 miles divided by one hour. That's 60 miles per hour. If I make the trip in two hours, the distance is still the same, 60 miles but it takes twice as much time, but that two, that bigger number is on the bottom of the fraction. So 60 divided by two, that's only 30 miles per hour. Whoops, so time doubled. <clears throat> and the speed was cut in half. And that's what we mean when we say the speed is inversely proportional to time. You could also say uh, you could reverse it and put it the other way around. Uh, if speed is proportional to one over time, then it's also true that time is proportional to one over speed. And that both of those are inverse relationships and they are equivalent to each other. <clears throat> okay. Okay, um, there's a couple more examples we can do of stuff like that, but I see we're close enough, I think, to the end of this segment that I'll continue on with that in the next segment. So I'll see you then.